Hello, I'm Molly Jacobs, a senior research associate at the Lowell Center for Sustainable Production, which is located at the University of Massachusetts Lowell in the United States. Our research institute has worked with governments, businesses, and non-governmental organizations for more than 20 years to help advance the development, evaluation, and adoption of safer chemicals, materials, and products. To help support the European Chemicals Agency's substitution strategy, we've developed this training series to better guide those within enterprises, government authorities, and non-governmental organizations who are looking to improve their knowledge and skills regarding an assessment of alternatives. Yet before we dive into what to expect from this training, we thought it useful to first step back and make the case for informed substitution and the role for an assessment of alternatives. Every day, there's a new collection of news headlines and research articles about hazardous chemicals and their harmful impacts. Hazardous chemicals can be found everywhere, from everyday products such as clothing, electronics, and food packaging, to even being found in remote locations across the globe. However, driven by both regulatory, market, and consumer demands, companies in the European Union and elsewhere are increasingly substituting away from the use of hazardous substances and towards the use of safer chemicals and greener technologies. Unfortunately, many substitution efforts have also fallen short in affecting a transition to safer, high-performing and cost-effective alternatives. Without careful ass assessment of alternatives, too often we're experiencing substitution regret as seen in some of these headlines. Substitution is a critical chemicals management strategy. Eliminating the use of a hazardous chemical or substituting it with a safer alternative is simply the most protective solution to keep workers, consumers, and the planet healthy. When we think about controlling the risks associated with using hazardous chemicals, unfortunately, the most common control measures employed in manufacturing set settings are sometimes the least effective. For example, use of personal protective equipment, which is shown in this hierarchy of controls as the least protective strategy to minimize the potential for exposure to toxic chemicals of concern, puts the responsibility on workers themselves. Yet we all know that human error is a reality, regardless how, how well your workforce is trained or how closely controlled processes may be. More protective, is the use of engineering controls, such as pollution control devices, which are designed to protect the internal and external environment of a manufacturing process. Things like ventilation hoods, air scrubbers, floor drains, and industrial wastewater neutralization systems are designed to address known potential sources of pollution. However, mechanical and chemical systems can and do fail from time to time, resulting in potential exposure to the chemicals they are designed to mitigate. Altogether, eliminating the hazard from a workplace or permanently reducing the risk by substituting with a less hazardous material allows you to bypass the issue of human error and engineering control failure. Elimination and or substitution prevents the risk by simply avoiding the use of harmful chemicals. There are many reasons to substitute and those reasons vary among company representatives when asked. For some companies, it's all about decreasing their exposure to risk. Whether the risk comes in the form of regulation or public relation problems or other financial liabilities related to using hazardous substances. By replacing a hazardous substance with a safer alternative, you save the time and effort involved in managing the risk related to its use. For others, substitution offers opportunities. By identifying how a specific function can be met in a less impactful way, new opportunities emerge. Substitution can be reframed from being primarily a regulatory compliance activity to an innovation strategy. Replacing a hazardous substance gives you a competitive advantage in the marketplace. Your customers will appreciate effective products that are also safer for workers and consumers and with fewer adverse impacts on the environment. Your informed substitution efforts can also enable your customers to gain a market advantage and reduce their costs of complying with the legislation on chemical safety. For others yet, substitution is embedded within their business operations. Substitution is continuous improvement. Looking for safer alternatives makes your company look systematically at what you are doing and how you are doing it. 
You may even realize that the function performed by the substance you are using is no longer necessary if you change your process or redesign your product. Revisiting your materials and production processes can also result, result in more efficiency, including lower use of resources or the generation of less waste. It's also important to end on the fact that many companies see substitution as simply doing the right thing. Reducing the potential risk for your employees working with a hazardous substance, for consumers using your product, and for the environmental impact of your activities, it's a good thing to do. You are playing your part in making Europe and beyond a healthier place for all and for future generations. As we began here with the various headlines, not all substitution efforts are equal. Without a careful assessment of alternatives, a hazardous chemical of concern can be replaced with an alternative that poses similar or even worse risks because the alternatives were not fully assessed in terms of their hazards. These are regrettable substitutes, not only from the perspective of workers, consumers, and the environment that bear the burden of the negative impacts, but also from a business perspective. Regrettable substitutes are often the consequence of a regrettable situation where substitutes are just poorly studied before being used. Regrettable substitutes may only buy a company a few extra years of time before they too become the focus of regulatory or market drivers that are targeting their phase out. A notable recent example of this is the replacement of endocrine disrupting chemical bisphenol A, also known as BPA, which is used in can lining and plastic beverage bottles with bisphenol S or another chemical called bisphenol F. These substitutes are structurally similar to, to BPA, making them more easily used as a replacement without significant changes to production processes. However, they simply were not well studied before being used as replacements. A recent research article examined 32 studies um, looking at bisphenol F and bisphenol S and found that they have similar effects to BPA, yet another case of regrettable substitution. Also regrettable can be when an alternative is adopted that results in lower performance or considerable cost to that, that customers or society are simply not willing to accept. The key to avoiding regrettable substitutions is to evaluate the alternatives before leaping to a replacement. Aim for a substitution that is once and done if possible. Finding a suitable replacement to a hazardous substance is all about informed substitution, not just substitution, but informed substitution. Over 10 years ago, the United States Environmental Protection Agency coined this term, informed substitution. It's defined as a considered transition from a chemical of particular concern to safer chemicals or non-chemical alternatives. The goals of informed substitution are to minimize the likelihood of unintended consequences, which can result from a precautionary switch away from a chemical of concern without fully understanding the profile of potential alternatives, and to enable a course of action based on the best available information on both human health and the environment that is available or that can be estimated. Informed substitution is of value to a range of stakeholders, from product designers looking to specify safer product ingredients, to process engineers who are trying to reduce hazardous production process chemicals or waste, to environmental engineers needing to comply with regulations or industrial hygienists who are looking to improve workplace safety, and consumer and procurement officers who are trying to purchase safer products and government regulators planning to restrict the use of hazardous chemicals. Stakeholders in these situations often know which chemicals they want to avoid, but may be uncertain about what chemical product or process redesigns are suitable substitutes. So then what is a suitable substitute? A suitable and preferred substitute is one that is safer for human health and the environment and is both technically and economically feasible. This may mean changing a production process, using an alternative chemical material or technology, redesigning a product, or changing the process to simply avoid the need for alternative, or making a systems change that similarly avoids the need for the chemical of concern or an alternative altogether. The goal of a safer alternative transition is to identify functionally equivalent alternatives that meet the performance and cost needs of a process or a product while eliminating the hazardous chemical. In Mary O'Brien's book, 
making better environmental decisions. She writes, one of the most essential and powerful steps to change is understanding that there are alternatives. Assessment of alternatives, or also known as analysis of alternatives, alternatives analysis, or alternatives assessment, is a tool for informed substitution. It's a tool to make informed choices about what are suitable substitutes. Assessment of alternatives is defined as a process for identifying, comparing, and selecting safer and suitable alternatives to chemicals of concern based on their hazard and exposure profiles, cost, and performance. Use of this approach facilitates the informed consideration of the various advantages and disadvantages of alternatives. Within the European Union's primary chemicals management legislation reach, an analysis of alternatives is included in its authorization and restriction provisions. An analysis of alternatives contains five main parts, and this is generally true of most assessment of alternatives approaches as well. The first key part is identifying alternatives for consideration to replace the function and use provided by the hazardous chemical of concern. Next, alternatives are then evaluated with regard to their technical feasibility based on functional and performance requirements and economic feasibility, whether there are changes in net costs, taking to, into account impacts on both costs and revenues related to adopting the alternative. Next, these al alternatives are assessed in terms of their risk profile, including inherent hazards and the potential for exposure to those hazards. Lastly, the alternatives are compared, considering risks and feasibility. More often than not, no alternative is perfect and trade-offs need to be considered and appraised. The last slide emphasized how analysis of alternatives is, um, is embedded within the EU regulatory context. Yet over the last decade, the field has grown tremendously. We're seeing other regulatory entities such as uh, the state of California and its safer consumer products regulation now requiring alternatives analyses. Uh, we're seeing a number of member state authorities in the EU developing guidance documents, as well as several guidance documents being issued out of um, the United States authorities, whether it be collaborations of state agencies like the Interstate Chemicals Clearinghouse or our own um, National Academy of Science here in the United States, all have come together to put together guidance documents. This is, this is just reflective, for example, of the growth of this field and also reflective of the need for guidance for companies who are really now going beyond the regulatory context and incorporating these assessment of alternatives just into their overall chemicals management approaches. Not only are there new assessment of alternatives frameworks and approaches that are moving beyond regulation and into standard business practices, there are also new methods, and even new tools. The Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD, has developed a website portal to this array of frameworks and resources and tools to support an assessment of alternatives called the OECD Substitution and Alternatives Assessment Tool Selector. So this now leads us to this assessment of alternatives training, why we developed it, what it contains, and who is it for. This training course was designed to provide information on best practices and tools for assessing alternatives as part of the European Chemicals Agency goal of promoting the use of safer and innovative substitutes for substances of concern. The training content focuses on essential assessment of alternative topics to support informed substitution. The content is geared for a range of practitioners, including those that are both new and experienced and those working in government, industry, and non-governmental organizations. The training content draws on experience from the EU as well as in the United States. Every session will bring in knowledge from experienced practitioners. Interspersed with the narrated presentations are readings, videos, and knowledge checks. These knowledge checks are not tests. They are tools to get you to pause and to make sure that you've captured key concepts before moving on. Lastly, the training seeks to connect the assessment with adoption and implementation needs, including links to research and innovation. The assessment is only useful if it actually drives change drives a movement towards the use of safer chemistries, materials, and technologies.
At the end of the training, you will be given the opportunity to take a training certification exam. There are five sessions in this training, each focused on discrete components of an assessment of alternatives. In the first session, we will focus on the first critical step of the assessment process, including defining the goals, the scope of the assessment, decision rules, among other issues that will guide the assessment process. Session two focuses on how to identify alternatives for consideration. It outlines the types of alternatives that are important to consider and what resources are particularly useful for identifying a range of alternatives to include for further evaluation. Sessions three and four are the main components of an assessment. These modules focus on the assessment of hazards and intrinsic exposure, as well as cost and performance. The order here is not necessarily the order in which you have to conduct each of these components. Some may choose to assess performance first, others hazard. Session five focuses on tools used to help compare and make decisions. The assessment of alternatives is action oriented. It is about making decisions to support and form substitution. Session five also focuses on implementation. It will review important considerations for implementing the results of the assessment. You will hear the voice of three trainers in this training course. Pam Eliason from the Toxics Use Reduction Institute in Massachusetts. Me, Molly Jacobs from the Lowell Center for Sustainable Production at the University of Massachusetts Lowell. And finally, Joel Tickner, who is also from the University of Massachusetts Lowell. Our team of trainers have extensive experience in the science, policy, and practice of assessing alternatives, as it has been a key tool to help industries in Massachusetts move towards safer substitutes. At the end of this training, you will be able to understand the importance of scoping and engaging stakeholders early on to improve the assessment process and the adoption experience. Know what types of potential alternatives to consider and where to look for them access new methods and tools to assist in the comparative assessment process, learn strategies for addressing uncertainty in the assessment and reconciling trade-offs when making decisions, and lastly, understand strategies for implementing the results of the assessment and linking it to continuous improvement initiatives. So now we're asking you to reflect. What's your substitution story? What's your assessment of alternative story? Have you had some challenges or any notable successes? Over the next five sessions, we hope to provide additional lessons, resources, and tools to set you up for success in future assessments of alternatives to support the informed transition to safer chemicals, materials, products, and technologies. <laughs>